a while ago when I was living in China, um, I remember a conversation I had with a young woman who told me that she is not a Christian, that she was not a Christian. Um, but as we talked, it became very apparent that she believed in the Christian God, regularly attended a Christian church, and was endeavouring to live a Christian life. So obviously I asked her what it was that caused her to say that she is not a Christian. And her answer surprised me because it's not an answer I've ever heard from an Australian and it was this. She did not think she could call herself a Christian because she had not yet been baptised. And that, that intrigued me. As I said, in Australia, I think someone in her position would call themselves a Christian and just say they just hadn't got around to getting baptised yet. But as I thought a bit more about her, I, I, I wondered if there really is something to her hesitation about claiming to be part of the Christian community when she had not yet taken that decisive step of publicly identifying with Christ, with Jesus in baptism. In China, baptism is a far more political act than in Australia, where the government keeps a close eye on registered churches and an even closer eye on underground churches. The choice to be baptised takes courage. For her to be baptised would be to publicly de declare that her first allegiance was to Jesus and not to the Communist Party. And there would be genuine risk involved in taking that step. And that is not unlike the first Christians in the Roman Empire. In baptism, they declared that Jesus is Lord and therefore Caesar is not. And that was a courageous step. That is a courageous step to take in any totalitarian state. In my time in China, I just want to quickly add, um, I was not aware of anyone being arrested simply for being baptised. And I'm not aware of any actual law saying that people can't be baptised. I certainly did hear of local church leaders being arrested and imprisoned and foreign missionaries being deported. But I was not aware of anyone being arrested just for being baptised. I don't think that's necessarily the risk that she would have been taking. But as a public statement of allegiance, baptism did change a person's political status. It could well mean that they would be watched a little more closely. It could well mean that they might be denied opportunities that would be open to people whose primary allegiance was clearly with their government. So, she, and um, about what, what it means to be a Christian and what it takes for us to be able to call ourselves Christian. She believed she had no right to take the name of Christ until she had acted with courage and obedience in baptism. She was clear that being a Christian was not just a matter of personal belief and personal preference and practice, it was also a matter of public declaration of allegiance to Jesus and, and identification with Jesus. And she had not yet made that declaration, so she did not feel she could take the name of Christian. And so I think she might have been a bit more comfortable than we are with that strong statement of baptism that we read in 1 Peter. Uh, in today's readings. Baptism now saves you. Now that's caused embarrassment to a lot of people of Reformed faith. Um, it's a bit startling, isn't it? Uh, for us who are raised uh, on salvation by faith alone, in Christ alone, that verse is a bit uncomfortable. How can baptism save us? How can anything we do bring about our salvation? Well, a little before uh, this, Peter connects baptism with Noah's Ark. Peter is saying that baptism saves us like the Ark saved Noah and Noah's family. 
Noah heard the voice of God, and Noah believed the word of God. But hearing and believing would not have saved him from the flood if he had not also acted on God's words. If he hadn't actually built the ark and got inside. God had done God's bit by telling Noah what to do and what was about to happen, but Noah had to do his bit by believing God and following God's instructions. There's a partnership at work here between God and Noah. Now, when you think about it, God could conceivably have found a way to save Noah without Noah having to do anything. Maybe God could have created a big bubble around Noah's family, perhaps. You know, God can do anything, but God is not like that. God works in partnership, always in partnership. God works in relationship. In the Noah story, God acts and Noah acts. They both contribute to the saving of the human race and that is how God chooses to work. God always desires to save, but God also always desires to have partners in salvation. And that's not because God wants puppets. It's not because God likes to see people following God's orders. I sometimes get the impression Christians think that, but it's not, it's not that. It's because God always, always, always wants to partner with us, wants to have partners in the work of salvation. If we were to say that Noah entered, that Noah earned God's favor by obeying God's instructions, and that was how he saved his family, that would completely miss the point. It's not about earning God's favor. God already likes him. God, he's already got God's favor. The point is, when God chose to save the human race, God chose to work with Noah to do it. God always chooses to work in partnership. So it is appropriate that the idea of covenant is introduced into the scriptures at this exact point. This is the first use of that word in the, in the scriptures. The Bible readings through Lent this year are all about covenant. So we're going to be returning and returning to that idea, thinking a lot about covenant over the next few weeks. What we notice today is firstly that God chooses to partner with a human in the salvation of humanity. That's very clear. And secondly, and just as important, we notice that this very first covenant that God makes in scripture is, is not actually with people. If you read it there, it's not with people, it's with all living creatures, with all creation. That's repeated four times. The author of Genesis says four, <laughs> four times in 10 verses that God's first covenant is with creation, not just with humanity. God makes a covenant with all creation. Now this is where the idea of covenant enters scripture, with God making a covenant with all creatures. So you see, I'm repeating it several times as well, just like the author of Genesis, just so you get the point. God makes this covenant in the, this promise that there uh, will never be another flood of the magnitude that they had just endured. So that's Genesis. And then Peter, in the New Testament, comes along um, in, in 1 Peter and tells us that the flood story is supposed to point us towards baptism. And, and that is in the sense of bringing people to salvation through water. Now, and that is done back then by them getting in a big boat and done now by an appeal to God in baptism for us to be included in the resurrection of Jesus. Now that is why he tells us that baptism saves us. 
It is what we do to agree to God's offer of partnership. It is how we sign up to the covenant God has made with humanity, just like Noah get building and getting in the ark was God's way of signing up to that partnership. Um, so baptism is, is kind of our way of getting in the boat. So in uh, the gospel reading this uh, today, we see that Jesus came to the Jordan River and was baptized by John. This uh, clearly was not about Jesus seeking forgiveness. This was about Jesus publicly signing on to participate in God's work of salvation. Jesus getting in the boat. Mark doesn't explain any of this in his gospel. He makes no effort to answer most of the questions that we might have. Um, yeah, I wasn't, wasn't thinking about 21st century Christians and the questions that we might have. Um, wasn't thinking about anyone's questions, really. Mark tends to just get straight down to business. No messing around with theories and explanations. So what he tells us is that Jesus' public act of baptism, God publicly acknowledging him to be God, to be God's son, the beloved whom God is, uh, with whom God is well pleased. See, partnership, covenant, God and humanity publicly declaring their commitment to working together. Jesus doing it through being baptised, God doing it through a public declaration of, um, of love and, and choosing of this, uh, of Jesus. And Mark also tells us that immediately afterwards, the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days. Baptism in the Jordan, followed by 40 days in the wilderness. Jesus was following the path of God's ancient people who crossed the Red Sea and then wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. The Son of God followed in the footsteps of humanity through the water of transition into the wilderness of hunger and temptation. He is, identi he is identifying here fully with God's ancient people as he identifies fully with us. And so right from the start, the church has baptised new believers in this act of double identification, identifying in baptism with Jesus, who was baptised in order to identify with us. This is an act of deep intimacy, deep mystery, deep partnership, deep covenant. And what about those wild beasts Jesus met in the wilderness? Well, we usually just read that bit about the wild beasts and think, oh, Jesus was in danger there. There were wild beasts around. Must have been scary. But since we've just read in Genesis about God making a covenant with all living creatures, with all creation, That gives us pause, doesn't it? We might wonder, might it mean more than that? Now, there are lots of stories about St. Francis and other saints preaching to animals. This is a, it's a, um, like a trope that just comes up again and again <coughs> in the stories about saints. Might, might that be what Jesus was doing, pre preaching? Reminding the wild ones that God has not forgotten the first covenant, that God is committed to the well-being of all creation, that the work of God, that God is about to do through Jesus is not just about saving humanity. It's about saving the wild ones too, the, the lions and the bears and the hyenas and, and the dogs and cats as well, I'm sure. When Jesus returns to the city after those 40 days, he begins to announce the arrival of God's kingdom to the people there. Well, maybe he made that announcement to the wild animals first. Because God is all about relationship, all about partnership, all about covenant. So, I think my friend in China had a point. To be Christian is to be in partnership with God for the good of all creation 
And baptism is the way that we publicly sign our name to that covenant. I don't think that means she's beyond God's grace just because she'd not yet taken the risk of being baptised. God certainly understands all that stuff and God is kind and gracious and merciful. Now, for us, baptism might not be a risky action, but I wonder if we are like that woman in other ways, just maybe a bit less honest about it. As we reflect on what it means to follow Jesus through Lent, are there things that come to mind that we're unwilling to do because they would be too risky? Are there people in our lives who we have never told what we really believe? Because you know, that's a bit scary. Are there aspects of our faith that we are holding back, keeping hidden, because we're afraid of how people might react? And more importantly than that, since God has called us into partnership for the welfare of all creation, are there parts of creation that are struggling and suffering? People, places, animals, ecosystems, and we're holding back from performing our part of the partnership because it would be too costly for us to speak up and get involved. Australia is a wonderful country in so many ways, but, well, we have the worst track record in the world for allowing native species to become extinct. As covenant partners with God, whom, uh, uh, with the God who makes covenant with all creation, what are we doing about that? What sort of ark are we going to build to save the creatures of our time and our place? Sometimes when we're faced with big issues like that, maybe we wish God was different. Maybe we wish God was willing to act alone, willing to bypass the weaknesses and foolishness and greed of humanity and just get the job done without us. Don't we sometimes think that might be better? But that would be like a parent stepping in and doing all all the things their children find difficult. And we know what happens to children who are parented like that. They don't learn, they don't mature. And so thank God, God is not like that. God believes in us. God has big plans for mature humanity. And God is all about relationship. That is our hope. God loves us so much and loves this world so much that no matter how often and how badly we mess up, God will keep choosing to work with us to bring hope to all creation. Amen.